Hello, I'm Tim George. And I'm Casey Andrews. Welcome to Ball State, the year in review. For the next 20 minutes, we are going to take you back as we examine the events that shaped Ball State University during the past year. The year definitely was an exciting one. Our men's basketball team was ranked in the top 20 for the first time ever and won a first round game in the NCAA tourney. The university kicked off its first ever capital campaign and has already reached the halfway mark toward its goal. There was the grand opening of the new Ball Communications Building while construction began on the new health, physical activity and arena complex. And we had snow at the spring commencement. It certainly was a wonderful and sometimes surprising year and there are many stories to share with you. So let's begin with the arrival of the students. By all outward appearances, the start of the fall term looked just like everyone before. As students poured onto the campus, there was no visible evidence that a major change had taken place. But once students reached the classrooms, the change became obvious. After years in planning, Ball State University began the academic year on a new calendar. The quarter system was history and semesters had taken its place. With semesters, the nine-month school year is divided in half instead of thirds as it was with quarters. Fall semester now lasts until Christmas and spring semester begins after the first of the year and lasts till early May. The main point I think about the change to semesters is that the semester calendar can give both faculty and students more time to develop their ideas, their research, the amount of reading they have in a 15-week time period. I think there are a number of things that one can do in that kind of time block that previously I would have to say it was impossible to do in a shortened period of time, in the case of the quarters, 10 weeks. Provost Warren Vanderhill says that next year should be even more successful now that everyone has had the time to adjust. This was a year of many firsts, as Ball State in a dramatic move described as the most significant action ever taken by the university, began its first ever capital campaign. Wings for the Future, Campaign for Ball State, is a five-year campaign designed to raise $40 million in private funds for the university. To kick off the event, over 300 invited guests attended a gala celebration in downtown Muncie. The evening included entertainment from the Ball State Marching Band and the university singers, along with descriptions of the campaign and a special viewing of a videotape designed to solicit funds. The university is a rocket poised to take off. Uh, there is a great sense of mission, a shared uh, sense of direction at the university. Um, uh, there is both in the administration and the faculty an excitement which I have felt in uh, becoming a part of the Wings for the Future campaign. And putting this human side of the equation into focus uh, tells any observer, whether they're academically uh, backgrounded or not, that Ball State is ready to use the money that comes from the capital campaign in a way that truly builds and achieves its vision of becoming a great teaching university. During the public announcement, President John Worthen disclosed that nearly half of the $40 million goal had been pledged. Nearly $1.2 million was raised in the first few months by faculty, staff, students, and emeriti. Officials of the Ball Brothers Foundation, who originally offered a challenge promising to match two for one every dollar donated by the campus community up to the goal of $1 million, announced they would extend their commitment to match the additional money raised. And in just six weeks, Ball State students raised nearly $32,000 during the Senior Challenge 89. The student portion of the Wings for the Future campaign marks the first senior class gift to the university since 1970. The 32000 which far exceeds the original goal of $20,000, will be used to restore the clock and chimes on the North Quad and for campus beautification projects. A Woodstock of the Mind was the phrase used to describe University 88, Agenda for a Living Planet. The Fall Festival of Intellectual Interchange was designed to examine society's obligation to the future and the role of creativity in solving potential problems of the future. Three internationally renowned scholars, including Pulitzer Prize winner Daniel Borstein, highlighted a week of outdoor concerts, exhibits, and class meetings taking place in a festival-like atmosphere. University students took an unusual approach to voice their opinion about the installation of condom machines in the residence halls last fall. For 25 cents, 
students could purchase condoms attached to cards asking the administration to change its decision to keep the machines out of the halls. University officials made condoms available at two locations on campus, including the student center, but did not allow the machines to be installed in the halls. Healthy living is translated into healthy learning at Ball State, where hundreds of students chose to live in wellness residence halls. The wellness hall program is designed to improve the students' awareness of their physical, mental, and emotional health. Each hall employs a no-smoking policy and around-the-clock quiet hours, as well as exercise equipment and various social programs. Nearly 1,200 students lived and participated in the six residence halls in the program. 1988-89 was without a doubt the most successful year ever for Ball State Athletics, and the highlight was the men's basketball team. Finishing the season with the best record in the nation at 29-3, the team reached the top 20 for the first time ever, ranked number 18 nationally. Along the way, they won the regular season Mid-American Conference, the MAC Conference Tournament, and the Golden Panthers Tournament in Miami, Florida. But the turning point was December 10th, when Ball State beat the Purdue Boilermakers. During the season, the Cardinals beat three Big Ten Conference teams and defeated Pittsburgh in the first round of the NCAA Tournament. It was Ball State's best season ever, and what a season it was. Unfortunately, our success did have a price as head coach Rick Majerus became a prime target of schools interested in improving their basketball program. On April 3rd, just two years after arriving at Ball State, Rick Majerus left for the University of Utah. After four days of consideration, it was announced that assistant coach Dick Hunsaker would replace Majerus leading the Cardinals. I want to continue this program in the direction that it, it, it's headed 
our emphasis first and foremost is going to be in academics. I know being a young coach, um, I'm going to get tried. It's going to, I'm, as I stand here, I know it's going to cost me some ball games down the road. But uh, I'm not going to have it hanging over my head that these student athletes that we bring in here are not going to be used or played for for the four years and not walk away from Ball State University with an education. The basketball team received national attention for its academic success when it announced in April that senior Rick Hall would be the first recipient of the NCAA's Walter Byers Postgraduate Scholarship. The scholarship is awarded nationally to one male and one female student athlete who displays the potential for success in postgraduate study. It's, it's hard to, for me to explain how much this award means to me. I mean, with it comes the scholarship, but it's not only that, it's, it's the honor and, and what this award stands for. The commitment to athletics and academics and community service are the three things that's probably guided my life the most the past four years. Hall will receive at least $7,500 as he pursues a degree in law at Northwestern University. While basketball received most of the attention this year, Ball State teams and other sports also had an outstanding year. The men's volleyball team went to the NCAA Final Four for the second straight year as they held a top ten ranking for most of the season. They featured the nation's number one spiker, sophomore Kevin Furnish, as head coach Don Shondell led Ball State to the championships for the fourth time in six years. Behind their motto, one game at a time, the football team compiled an 8-3 record for their best season in 10 years. The 1988 squad featured the Mid-American Conference Defensive Player of the Year, Greg Garnica. And it's a good thing this is senior Bernie Kaufman's last year playing for the women's softball team because she has almost run out of school records she can set. Kaufman has over 20 records including the most wins in a career with 76. And to top off her college career, she was named the MAC Conference Player of the Year. On a different sports note, wheelchair athletes who competed in the 1988 Summer Olympics in Seoul, South Korea, first came to Ball State last spring to train. Ball State was chosen as the official training site for nearly 60 athletes from throughout the nation. In addition to the wheelchair athletes, Ball State was the training ground for Lori Bennett, a sprinter and long jumper who earned a bronze medal at the Paralympics last fall. Bennett, who is blind, is attending Ball State studying to be a family counselor. Nearly 250 university officials, students, and politicians braved a chilly October afternoon to break ground for the state's premier health and physical activities facility at Ball State. The 191,000 square foot facility will house the Human Performance Laboratory, School of Physical Education, Institute for Wellness, Men's and Women's Athletics, and a 12,000 seat arena. Two-thirds of the $25 million needed for the new complex comes from the state legislature, with the rest funded through private donations. While construction began on one major new facility, another opened for business. The Edmund F. Ball Communications Building was officially opened in September during a celebration that included over 500 guests, four television cameras, and one satellite uplink. The new $8.1 million building is the most sophisticated effort of its kind to join state-of-the-art telecommunications equipment with educational programs. The ceremony held in one of the television studios within the building was shown throughout the campus so that the entire university in the state of Indiana could participate and see the capabilities of the new facility. The Ball Communications Building houses the Department of Telecommunications, the Center for Information and Communication Sciences, WBST Public Radio, WIPB Public Television, and University Media Services. The University Campus of the Future will be an electronic environment where words like uplink and transponder are as common as homecoming and fraternity. This is the idea behind TEMCOF, the teaching environment model of the campus of the future. Ball State and AT&T formed a partnership in 1987 to create a communications network made up of more than 7,000 voice, 800 data, and 200 video locations. The network, which is coordinated by the Center for Information and Communication Sciences, allows users to dial up a videotape for viewing in one of the specially equipped classrooms on campus and control the playback using a touch panel in the wall. 
AT&T Marketing Vice President Bernard Sergisketter says that Ball State was chosen as the model because of its innovative and effective teaching. We found an environment in which the university's representatives would work cooperatively with us in solving information movement and management problems with our technology. And that allowed us to do more at less cost of doing business, especially in, in uh, terms of aggravation. And that made the partnership more valuable to both our institutions. University President John Worthen said that Ball State will improve its learning environment as faculty are encouraged to use appropriate technologies in teaching. More and more high school students now consider Ball State their first choice when choosing a college. Last fall, the enrollment was right on target with what the Board of Trustees had decided was the optimum size for the university. The total of 18,156 students included the largest freshman class in Ball State's history. At one point, however, applications for the 1989-90 school year were up 43 percent over the previous year. With the student retention rate also on the rise, the university was forced to stop accepting applications earlier than ever before. During a year in which Ball State made news in so many positive ways, it was particularly unfortunate that two incidents occurred causing concern for both the university and surrounding community. Following the annual fall watermelon bust, partygoers turned unruly, resulting in a confrontation with police that ended with over 15 arrests. In March, the celebration after Ball State's first NCAA tournament win also got out of hand with damage to property both off campus and in residence halls. Presidents, singers, comedians, and at least one stupid pet are among the celebrities that have appeared on stage at Ball State over the past two and a half decades. Emmons Auditorium turned 25 years old this year, where more than 3.6 million people have passed through the auditorium doors to see the likes of Louis Armstrong, Arthur Fiedler, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and others. The box office champ continues to be Red Skelton, who sold out three appearances in 1977. According to Earl Williams, who has managed the auditorium since its opening, his job has been filled with memorable moments, including one that was perhaps better suited for the David Letterman show, as a production of Camelot was highlighted by a performance of a dog that was not stage broken. Williams said that it stopped the show. When May rolled around, 2,500 graduates donned caps and gowns for the 1989 spring commencement. The Arts Terrace was decked out for the occasion, and the procession started right on schedule but the fickle Indiana weather turned spring commencement into a winter wonderland. Surrounded by budding trees and flowering shrubs, students, faculty, family, and friends braved 44 degree temperatures and snow as the main commencement ceremonies took place. Three honorary doctoral degrees were awarded, most notably to former Indiana Governor Robert Orr. It was the culmination of a memorable, unforgettable year and a new beginning for Ball State's latest graduates. Just as graduation signaled the end of the school year for our students, it will also serve as the end of our show. We hope you've enjoyed looking back at the events and achievements which made this such a special year. We leave you now with the special words that every student longs to hear. I'm Tim George. And I'm Casey Andrews. So long, everyone. I confer upon you your respective bachelor or associate degrees with all rights, honors, privileges, and obligations thereunto pertaining. All right.